Hi, it's G and Yanka from Amazing Parenting and the Practical Parenting Podcast. Today, we're really excited to have with us Roger Domagalski. Did I get it right? Great. Aha, super cool. And he's in Poland right now. And uh, do you want to give us a little bit of uh, who you are, what you do? Can you tell us a little bit of information? Sure. First of all, hi. Nice to see you both again. No, oh, hello, 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 yeah. hello. Oh, by, uh, by, by the way, we might get interrupted by the kids. I just got to put that in. I just got to, sorry, I meant to mention that at the start. Um, three kids running around, so um, they might jump in at any point in time. Right. So, anyway, well, sorry. There's, there's no worry of that here because I've locked uh, my daughter in the basement. So, oh, excellent. No excellent. It's a, one of the many advantages of having basements. Exactly. There you go. Uh, and I, yeah, I live here in Warsaw. Okay. Um, capital of Poland. Mm -hmm. uh, very close to the uh, river, the Vistula River, which mm -hmm. I can just about see if I look over my left shoulder because of the fog. It's a little bit, but we live very close to the river. Mm -hmm. And I have lived here for 26 years almost. Wow. Wow. Hey, we got, we've got a bit of snow around here. What's it like up there? We did too this morning. Last oh. night and this morning we had a light dusting of snow. Okay. But the weather forecast uh, is going to be, you know, like seven, eight degrees by the weekend. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yanka was out earlier and uh, she said she almost froze to death. It's about uh, it's, it's about minus three here at the moment. Oh, a little one. We've got a little one in the, <laughs> a little one in the room. Okay. She is. Um, she okay? I'm not sure what she's saying. Um, <laughs> that's what happens. Right, there we go. Um, yes, go ahead. So, um, we're here today to talk about parenting and experiences of parenting, and we're hoping that we can pick up a little bit of advice from your experience. So, the, the first important question is, are you a parent? Yes, I am. Super cool. And... Can you can you tell us a little bit more about uh, your your child or children? What what's your situation sure. with that? I have uh, three children. Okay. I have two children who are adults. My son Stefan is now he was born in 1980, so that makes him what 37. And my daughter Kate was born in 1987, so she's 30 right now. And uh, I have a daughter, Mia, who is five. Mm -hmm. Wow. And um, the one thing that's really, that, that's really interesting for me to explore in terms of parenting is I'm always comparing myself to my own parents and my, my parenting style to their parenting style. So from your perspective as a parent, would you say that your, your approach was similar to your own parents or was it different? No, it's different. Okay, okay. So can you define any of the differences that, that, that exist between their approach and your approach? I think the basic uh, and, and fundamental difference is that I uh, try to listen to my child mm -hmm. and I talk to my child. My parents were, let's face it, old school. Mm -hmm. um, they told children what to do. They didn't really care very much what the children felt, what they thought. Um, they were supposed to listen, and, and that's where it ended. Whereas, uh, you know, I have a different approach, and I listen to my child. Do you think, do you think that's uh, the same for a lot of people in, in, in the modern world, that in the past parents were perhaps stricter and more authoritative, but... Uh, parents in general or do you think they're more open now or what's your experience well i hope they're more open but uh but going back to that word you said about being strict i i sometimes i i, I do consider myself a strict parent so I'm, I'm not one of these guys who you know just let the kids do whatever they want mm -hmm. i should really focus now on on my youngest child because my uh, my two older children are adults Mm -hmm. And they live in the United States. So mm -hmm. my role as a father is rather finished with them in the sense of uh, mm -hmm. someone who's mm -hmm. shaping someone who's yeah. growing up. Well, that's, 
when I was thinking about this interview today, one of the questions that popped into my head was, when does the parenting end? You know, when is there, is, or is there ever a point? Because in communication with my own parents, I'm, I'm always hearing this line, well, we're still your parents, you know, and it's like, whoa, okay. You know, is, is, there, is there a point where it finishes? I think in most uh, situations, it probably isn't. I think it's, uh, as you describe it, it, it goes on forever. Parents tend to look at their children as, as, as people needing their help and guidance in some way, one way or another, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but in my case, because of the specific circumstances, um, it, it really did end uh, in a way that it may not, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, in a normal situation because I left the United States and my children remained there, my older children who are now adults. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, in that case, my role as a as a parent, I would think much in the case of in a divorce where where the father, for example, moves to a different state or a different part of the country and ceases to have that regular day to day regular contact with their children and. That's, that's the sense I mean that mine ended with my kids. We were just too far away physically for me mm -hmm. to play a direct role in their daily lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I saw, um, I think I saw a picture of your daughter uh, online recently where you went to the, uh, you went to a ballet or an opera or something, or was, was that, was there some, 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 some trip or something that was special for her? No, it was very special. It was uh, this past Sunday, three days ago, we went to see the uh, Nutcracker Ballet here in Warsaw at the National Opera House. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And what was, you, you want to do that as well. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. that sounds great. Wow. And what was, what was her reaction to it? Well, she loved it. Yeah. She loved it. I was fortunate enough to, to uh, take this photograph of her just when she turned around. And this expression on her face was was absolutely natural, and mm -hmm. and it was just uh, you could see the delight mm -hmm. in her eyes and in, in, in her smile, because uh, the opera house is beautiful. Let's mm -hmm. face it, physically, all that marble, all those chandeliers, the crystal mm -hmm. chandeliers, and here's this this huge uh, Christmas tree mm -hmm. in the center of the foyer when you come in, <clears throat> and of course this was at, at uh, the intermission after the first act. So she had seen half of the ballet and we were looking at the tree and then we were to go back. So, so she was delighted with the experience, yes. Mm -hmm. There must have been a, a great sense of wonder from her perspective at all of these, all of these things together, the, 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 the music and the place and the, the architecture and everything all together. And Absolutely. It, being, it being Christmas as well, you know. Absolutely, it all it, it all comes together. She's um, she's uh, a great fan of like music, and she she goes to the Philharmonic regularly with my wife. My mm -hmm. wife that that's the thing that they do together. They go mm -hmm. regularly to the Philharmonic. There's a series of children's concerts on Sundays, and and they go regularly. So she's used to that, but she had never been to a ballet before, and so. This is the first time where she actually saw the dancing, and I, she really loved that as well. I'm feeling an area that we need to improve on here. Yeah, William yeah. actually said that he would like to see a concert live, but I, I couldn't find anything in the streets at the time. I have to look Would for you, that. Do you mean you can't find anything? The streets has more concerts than, than any other. Yeah, well, he didn't mean a rock concert, right? <laughs> he wanted some classical music. Classical music? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, yeah. this is a great time of year to look for classical music. I'm sure there's lots of stuff in the churches. Yes. And anyway, right, that's <laughs> stuff that we have to work on. Thank you. Thank you for the pointer. Thank you for the pointer. Now, a lot of, a lot of parents feel that uh, they're not really prepared for the parenting experience. They, they, you know, we don't really, there's, there's not really a school for it. Maybe there shouldn't be a school for it. Um, so... Would you describe yourself as someone who was ready to be a parent, or was it something that you uh, picked up as you went along in terms of experience? You can compare the two two experiences as well with with your, you know, older kids and the sure. Older one. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, I would just say in general, I don't think anyone's prepared to be parents the first time around. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, I certainly wasn't, <clears throat> even though I was already in my 30s. Uh, so I wasn't this wet behind the ears, you know, teenager or 20 year old. I was already in my 30s when I had my kids, but, but I really wasn't ready. Okay. But certainly by the time uh, we had Mia, uh, I was four months shy of 64. So I was ready. <laughs> okay. So um, what is that? What is that extra? What is it in that extra experience that that that, that makes you makes you ready? You know, if um, if you meet, for example, say a young couple and they know that they're going to become parents, you know, what is what is it that you can pass on to them or communicate to them about the parenting experience? Every, <laughs> That's a big question. I'm sorry. It is a huge question because um, when you're 35. You're a much different person, completely different than when you are nearly 70. Um, you look at the world differently. You see life differently. You've experienced more of life. Mm -hmm. And simply living that many years gives you a different perspective. OK. Um, could, could you give me one? One sort of little little nugget or example of of that, uh, because um, I understand that it's that that it's different. But uh, uh, could you could you give me one thing that sure. perhaps you you do or that you've noticed or that you've seen in that? Sure. Way? Just obviously talking about my own experience. Mm -hmm. When uh, when my son was born, I was thirty two years old. And uh, as most 32-year-old men in the United States, I would venture to guess, uh, I was busy with my career, whatever that might mean. I was busy with my job. I was busy making it. You know, uh, to be a man and to be in your 30s is a, mm, in one way, it's a very exciting, but it's also a very horrible time mm -hmm. because you see before you flashing this light that says four zero on it and you know you have to make it before mm -hmm. you hit that light mm -hmm. because otherwise it'll be too late you'll be on the downward slide and all of this stuff in the capitalistic system you know i don't want to go into a whole economics mm -hmm. lecture here but when you're 30, at least that was my experience. Okay, let's stick to my experience. And I was 32. I was more interested in what I was doing with my life, how much money I was making. Am I going to get this promotion? Am I not? And um, the child was like, oh, yeah, part of the package comes with marriage. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh there's a kid. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can understand that. Yeah. Now, when you're 64, or almost 64 and you have a child, all that bullshit of making it is behind you. You don't have that to worry about. And can you imagine what a relief that must be? Because it is, I can tell you, it's a big relief. Can you? <laughs> can you, can you? I would, I would love to imagine. I'm not even sure that I can, I can imagine even close to what 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 that's what that's like, um, but it must be a a relief and a, a a release. It must be a little bit of the pressure off. Of course, absolutely, sure. Wow. So I think that it's true that that definitely will make will make a difference. Um, what about what about time? I mean, do you have more time to spend with? Obviously, you probably have more time to spend with Mia than you had before when you were trying to make it, right? Uh, what 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 factor do you think time or what role does time play in the in the parenting thing? Huge. Mm -hmm. It's probably the most important factor. If I had to list them all, time is the most important factor. Mm -hmm. Time that you can spend with your child, mm -hmm. um, sharing your life with that child. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, in our in our previous discussion, we we touched very briefly on I think on quality time, um, and I think that you were talking about some experience you had with uh, with talking to someone at work. Can you can you uh, repeat the story because it was a very nice little story. For us. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, mm. I had started in a new job at uh, a large uh, bank, commercial bank in Charlotte, North Carolina, where. I was living at the time, and um, I was talking to um, the vice president of the, the whole marketing and advertising division, and uh, I had already been hired for the job, but he was just giving me a, a cordial chit-chat, and he started to ask me about my relationships, my wife, my family, and I told him what I like to do. He says, well, what do you like? I said, I have a vegetable garden. I like going home. And, working in the garden after work. He said, yeah, okay. And how much time do you spend with your kids? And so I, I told him and he said, yeah, I like spending uh, quality time with my kids too. He said, uh, I work hard here at the bank, but, but every week I make sure that I take them for a week to Disney World. And we yeah. have that quality yeah. time. So there's like once a year he would make time and take the kids to, to, to Disney, right? Yeah. And, and he was giving me that as an example of what he defined as quality time. <laughs> I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. I didn't say anything because I didn't want to jeopardize my, <laughs> my new job. Yeah. But I realized we were on two different planets, he and I, mm -hmm. because it's not one week at Disney World that, that constitutes quality time. Mm -hmm. It's what you do every day, every weekend, every month with your mm -hmm. kids and your family. Sure, that's what's quality, what that, what, that's what means, what quality time means. Absolutely. Yeah, it's the, it's the experiences of the, the days that, that add up, really. It's uh, what Yanka said about the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, if you don't put the time in, mm -hmm. then you're not gonna get the results. I mean, I, I mentioned this the other day too when we were talking that um, when, uh, when Mia was young, I would often look at her and see her doing things. As she was a toddler, then as she started walking, in around 11 months, 12, she was a year old, and she was walking around the apartment. And then I said once to, to Joanna, my wife, I said, you know, I don't remember Stefan, my son. I, I don't remember Stefan ever doing that. And she just smiled and looked at me, and she said, it's because you were never there. Yeah. And I realized how right, how correct she was. I was off flying around, doing business, coming home for the weekends, and I would see him Saturday and Sunday, and then I was gone again. And here were all these evenings when he was learning to walk, when he was doing these other things, and I wasn't there. Of course I didn't remember it. Mm -hmm. How could I? Yeah, it was, um, it was killer for me when I wasn't working uh, from home, and I would get up in the morning and go to work and come home late in the evening and th there's like there's zero quality time with your kids when you're doing that it's, yeah. it's really crazy when you're when you're losing the constructive productive part of the day to work rather than family it it really grinds you down over a period of time so i think it's really important for for parents to to, to think about it maybe they can't solve the problem instantly but they can you know take a day off here or there and uh try to try to make the time available for their well, kids. quite frankly i i think i suspect that for some men mm -hmm. I, I won't say most mm -hmm. but perhaps um their jobs are an escape from parenting yeah, that's I've, a very interesting perspective. I've I've come to that conclusion as yeah. well. Where, not not only with some, um, not only with some men, but I've I've seen that experience with with women as well. Where where it's like, okay, well, you know, I have to put my my child into the the daycare, which I think is a horrible term. <laughs> now, and it's like, well, don't you want to spend time with your with your son or with your daughter? Yes, I want to spend time with my daughter, but I have to go to work. But it's your son or daughter. Don't you want to spend time? Listen but to it's my career. You know, yeah, 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 that's it. That's it. I need to go to work. It's like, well, yeah, think. But what is your what does your son or daughter need? Forget about what you need. 
Well, it's not, it's not just about the need, but in Slovakia, you usually stay with your kid for, for the first three years of their life. Right. And then all the mothers are like, finally, I will get to live a normal life, right? I just can't wait to just ship those kids away and, and, and you know. And do what? Get, what do get back to work and get back to adult conversations and, mm -hmm. and you know. But you know, so. three years. Which is similar to, I think, in Poland as well. You know, we have a long mater maternity leave period, and there's a lot yeah. of support for mothers. But compare that to the United States. I mean, I had two kids in the United States, so I know exactly how that works. Mm -hmm. They get a few weeks off, two or three, four weeks off, if that, and they're back to work. Two weeks off, and then back to that's. Yeah, the, there's no maternity leave in the same way that there is in Slovakia or in Poland in the United States. So women who are working, who need to bring in an income, mm -hmm. have to leave the kid and go. That's just sad. Leave, yeah, it's it's like you, you, you have a kid and then then you don't have a kid anymore because you've given it away. You well, know that according to Balbi... Right. Oh, your favorite author. Uh, my favorite guy, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the author of the attachment therapy, uh, theory. Yeah. Uh, if kids are placed into a daycare before the age of one, mm -hmm. uh, there's statistically higher probability of psychological problems or disorders later in life. Yeah. Statistically, well, right? Well, there's, there's also the, uh, the abandonment feelings as well. The children who are placed... Children who obviously need their parents, specifically the mother, if the mother's breast, it's like, oh, what about breastfeeding? Oh, my God. I mean, that just complicates that whole, mm -hmm. whole, whole issue as well. But um, the, um, the children who are, who are placed early into the, the nurseries or daycare, they have this feeling of abandonment, which is the, the parents are not there. So obviously, from the child's perspective, the parents are not interested. Doesn't doesn't matter what else is happening in the world, from the from the perspective of the child who's trying to understand things. It's just like, well, they they are not they're not here because they don't want to be here, and yeah. you, that's the the rationale. They don't, they don't understand the time factor of that age either. So when mm -hmm. they can't see the parent, they think the parent's not existing in that moment. Oh yeah, because you know, the three hours to three weeks, you can't explain that to a child like under un, under two. A lot of the time, I mean that that's that's really, yeah. So then you say, okay, I'll be back. I'll I'll see you later. Could be like I'll see you in five years, right? It just doesn't really communicate. Well, I, I agree with you, and that's true at the beginning. But I but I will defend daycare because uh, daycare in the sense of preschool. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Okay. Because Mia has been um, has been attending a preschool since she was two. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have been very, very pleased with uh, the effects on her as, in terms of her intellectual development, her emotional development, her social skills, her mm -hmm. intellectual skills. Um, but again, you have to be careful where you send the child. The, the situation you described was exactly that when she first went there. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, of course, the separation and anxiety. There was the crying. Uh, but with a well-trained and sensitive staff, mm -hmm. women who really understand what the child is going through because they specialize in early development of, uh, of young children, yeah. uh, they knew how to mitigate the worst of those problems, make it better. And, and children are inherently adaptable. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got kids who, who grow up in wartime situations. And they survive and they become functioning adults. So, so those kids are, are, are very adaptable. And when you, if you choose the right school with the right approach to children mm -hmm. and kids, which we think we have done, um, given the, the, the progress, uh, then it can be a very positive experience for the kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the quality is definitely uh, extremely important, especially of the staff. Mm -hmm. Also, the adaptation period could be really? useful when the parent can actually come there with the child and spend some time in the daycare with the child until the child gets more used yeah, to it. Yeah, we did that. Mm -hmm, yeah. That's great. How does, a, how does a parent know which kind of school or nursery is the right kind of nursery for their, for their child from your perspective? I'm saying that because not just in relation to nursery, 
schools. But obviously, your parents have to make choices about which school for their children to go to um, if they want their child to go to school and there's not some kind of other other option available. And with a variety of different kinds of education generally available. There are schools that have slightly different focuses. There are schools that are more open. There are schools that are more uh, religious. In this part of the world where we are in Slovakia, there's technical schools and sports schools and business schools and art schools. So um, it can be confusing for a parent to have to make these choices. So so in your experience, which what would be a good way to, to, to approach it? Well, I think as with any important decision, you don't look at brochures and you don't look at advertisement because that's just, you know, propaganda. Uh, so you go talk to the people involved. Uh, you talk to the director of the school, the founder. In our case, we talked to the founder of the school. Mm -hmm. uh, we also talked, uh, I had a good friend who had two of his children going there. And we had uh, several hours of discussions about the pros and cons and what he liked about the school, what he didn't like about the school. And um, we chose it because of its approach to kids in terms of how it sees the young developing child and how it nurtures that. Uh, it's a private school. Um, and it also focuses on languages. It's, it, in fact, it, in its name, it, it, it's called the International Three Languages School of Warsaw. So uh, Mia has been learning Polish, English, and Spanish uh, since she was uh, two. And, uh, and as I say, we've been extremely pleased with the, with the results. Wow. wow, three languages. That's, that, that's fantastic. That's so many doors that will open for her. In the yeah, and all of, the, all of the teachers at the school are native speakers. Mm -hmm. So we've got native speaking English speakers from the United States, Australia, Canada, um, and uh, uh, Spanish speakers from, of course, Spain, but also from Colombia, from Peru. Uh, so you, you have a, a nice mix, and of course, with Polish native speakers here from Poland. Mm -hmm. So she hears the language, she has heard the language now for now three and a half years, um, from native speakers. So when she speaks, mm -hmm. it, it's the way it's meant to be spoken. Super. Um, so you, you have experience of the systems in, in Poland and in the United States. So would you say the education systems are different or similar? I mean, what's, what's your perspective on that? Different. Okay. Uh, better or worse? Better here. Because? In, in what way? <laughs> well, the depth and breadth of the subject matter. In my experience in the United States is, uh, at least this was in, 19, in the 80s, um, preschool was merely a place where they sat and played with building blocks or other little plastic gadgets for most of the day. It was just a place to warehouse the kids with some adult supervision yeah. for a number of hours while the parents worked. A bit like a waiting room or something. Sounds like. whereas, whereas here at the school that we uh, selected, they have an actual program mm -hmm. and a curriculum with subject matter. And Mia, for example, has learned about the cosmos, our mm -hmm. planetary system. She knows all the planets in three languages, you know, in the solar system and about mm -hmm. evolution. And I mean, there's a, she has had things that I never had at her age. Mm -hmm. But then again, it's a different situation because when I was her age, I was home with mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I didn't go to any preschool. I didn't go to any kindergarten. Yeah. I went directly to first grade when I was seven. Mm -hmm. So the first six years I spent, spent with my mother. So I didn't have any of that kind of uh, exposure to, to those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, but Mia has had this, uh, this incredible exposure to a, a, a broad uh, range of uh, subjects mm -hmm. that she is now, you know, conversant in. in mm -hmm. with, with such a large investment in, in education and in say teacher training, for example, in the United States, what, what, what are the failures of that system then? How come it's just not so good? It, it's hard for me to actually say, having been away for 26 years, you know? Uh, I can only assume that, that the situation is worse than it was when I, 
I, I, I can't mm -hmm. imagine that it's improved mm -hmm. with this no child left behind and mm -hmm. what I've read about and this insistence on testing and standardized mm -hmm. test scores and all of this other stuff. What, what, a, what, a, what an amazing piece of negative terminology that is, no child left behind. I mean, why would you even contemplate, you know, looking backwards instead of forwards with education? I mean, that, that, that's, that's, that's like something, yeah. It's crazy. And also, I, I, I think there's a, there's a parallel because my feeling about the, the Slovak education and the British system is that uh, I think the Slovak system up to the age of 18 is much better and much broader than the British system. Of course, when you get to university, things change <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, lecturers with real experience and uh, the, the general, general quality of education there and investments in education. But, but um, I'd agree with you. I'd agree with you there. Excuse me for interrupting. But I, I'd agree with you there in terms of this difference between elementary high school, which in Poland is far, it's light years ahead of the United States. A, a, a high school graduate here in Poland knows basically what a university graduate knows in the United States. Yeah, I, I tend to think, see, it always confused me, although I understand the, uh, the compartmentalization elements. Um, you know, I always thought of like the British system as something like a pyramid, right? As you get older and get further up the pyramid, you're studying less subjects. It's like 12, down to 8, down to 5, down to 3, and then down to 1, at, at, maybe at university. Whereas... More, a more organic form of education should be kind of like a tree and you should be like, like growing out into all these different areas and realizing the connections between everything. And I think that the, the education system, obviously Poland, Slovakia, and in this part of the world is giving people a, up to the age of 18, probably a broader range of experiences and uh, um, a different perspective. Much broader, much broader. Whereas, uh university it, it's much different i i uh, have a degree in psychology and uh, i remember talking to uh, a, a woman here in poland once who uh, she also graduated from, with a degree in psychology we started to, to compare experiences mm -hmm. and i was uh, i was surprised and shocked that her almost entire five years at university was was limited to sitting in a large lecture hall and listening to some person lecture, speak, read from notes, and that was it. I said, well, what about lab? And did you ever work with rats? No. Did you ever work with cats? No. Any experience with monkeys? No. No experimental psych? No nothing? No no hands-on? She said, no. no it's, it's more theory, writing down notes, regurgitating that on tests. Mm -hmm. Whereas my experience uh, in the University of the United States was uh, was much more was much richer and much more broader and much more interesting. Yeah, Slo Slovak University students are pretty much useless because <laughs> they have a huge amount of theoretical knowledge, but they can't use it. Uh, I'm speaking yeah. from my own experience, like having been that student, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we have uh, extremely low self confidence. We are afraid to speak. Uh, in front of other people. It's just, it, as you said, it's just sit down, write notes, and then well, write it down. At the yeah, if, but if you think you're afraid to speak, imagine what it was like in, in my school. I went to a good school in the north of Scotland mm -hmm. where I grew up, and, and we had no verbal skills training at all. Zero. The entire way through education, we never had to stand up in front of the class and speak. We never had to give any presentations. We never had any oral exams. It, 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 and, and that's probably the single most important skill that a person needs. Well, we did have oral exams, but I had a lecture from the United States because I studied languages. And Wise girl. when he came <laughs> to the class and, you know, he would ask questions and nobody would budge, right? And he said... <laughs> He said, this is the main difference between a U.S. university classroom and Slovak university classroom. In U.S., everybody will raise their hands and everybody wants to speak even when they don't know anything. And I've got this classroom full of people with a huge amount of theoretical knowledge and everybody is scared to even move. <laughs> so I, 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 I don't know where that happened. That exactly as an English teacher here in Poland for 25 years, that, that uh, my students would sit there 
quietly. Yeah. And, uh, but they, they learned that, that with me, they had to interact. Uh-huh. That yeah. was, they loved it. I was watching a Jordan Peterson lecture the other day, and the camera was at the the back of the the, the auditorium or the class, and like uh, looking down at at Jordan Peterson on the stage talking, or at the front of the class, and everyone had a laptop open in front of them with their head down, sort of typing into the laptop, and I was I was thinking there's no communication. Th- 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 they're missing. They're missing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I they're, agree. They're, they're missing the point completely. That it's yeah, it's good to have. It's good to have notes for sure. But you know, you can hit the record button on your mobile phone and you know, and ch- check it out later and stuff. And I realize that people are under time pressure. But you, just like parenting, you've got to enjoy the moments as they happen. Exactly. I think pretty much as well. So talking about education and and children going through that experience what kinds of skills do you think that is going to be important for for children to pick up now that will be useful for them in the future well on the one hand of course there are the obvious technological skills you know how to use a computer tablet smartphone those kinds of things which Mm -hmm. me already knows how to do all too well (laughs) (laughs) but but i think uh really it depends how you view the future, but, uh, but perhaps any way you view it, um, these skills will, will come in handy. And these are some of the things that I have tried to teach her, and that is how to grow plants from seeds, uh-huh. you know, uh, how to eat beans raw. You don't have to cook them. <laughs> she loves them. That's the way she, she, she loves to eat. Okay. You can, uh, see, I see, see, I'm so ignorant about all this You can sprout stuff, them, right? and then you can eat them raw. Or no, just pick or just pick the green beans off the stalk. And oh yeah, absolutely. They're delicious, <laughs> and that's uh, Mia's favorite way of eating them. Mm-hmm. Um, I want her to know how the natural world works, about how what what happens in spring, mm-hmm. summer, fall, winter. You know, um, when we uh, we were talking about time before. Um, some of the best times we spend are uh, on the way to and from preschool. We live fairly mm-hmm. close, grab the bus, four stops, but then from the bus stop to the school, it's a 10 minute walk. Mm-hmm. And on the way there's a park and kind of a field with wildflowers and, and depending on the season of the year, we'll always, I'll always stop and point things out to her, mm-hmm. you know, and so she notices, because I want her to be an observant child who notices how things work in the world, and she, now she knows that the the trees surrounding her school, the black locust, is the last one to drop its leaves. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know? So I, I want her to know these basic things about where food comes from, how to raise it, uh, because if tough times come, and let's face it, looking back on human history, they always do. In one way or the other, tough times always come. I want her to be able to survive, Mm -hmm. to be able to find food, Mm -hmm. grow food, uh, not throw up her hands in despair because the supermarket is closed or because the shelves are empty. Mm -hmm. So I think those kinds of... I don't even want to use the word survival skills because that Mm -hmm. brings to mind all sorts of you know, mm-hmm. images, it, it, but life skills, maybe, maybe that, that's a good way of putting it, kind of life, life skills. Absolutely. Life, life skills are survival skills. I mean, I think that's, a, yeah. I mean, what, what is the point of school if it's not giving you survival skills, yep. right? Because, uh, you know, you, you, there are things that you're going to need at some point in time in the future. We have kids running around all over the place here, so if we yeah. get distracted, <laughs> Apologize. So, um, yeah, the technical skills, as you mentioned, um, are going to be important for uh, communication, just as we are doing this through Skype right now. Learning about the natural world, obviously very important. I'm very um, proud of Yanka for knowing all about that stuff. And when she takes the children out, she she can say, this is this kind of tree and this leaf is from from this other kind of tree. And I'm, you know, I'm a bit, I'm like, 
tree. There's a couple of trees. Are they the same or different? I'm not sure. <laughs> right. So, so um, it's definitely nice to nice to get that information, and it's nice to have the the, the parental guidance to uh, to uh, to be a model for for what the child needs to know, as well. Um, Something else that's, that's um, been on our mind recently um, is parenting through through fears. We all have our own individual fears and problems with certain issues and topics. Um, for example, one for me was um, swimming. When it came time for my son to learn how to swim, I personally had a fear of water. And my son picked up on this. Mm-hmm. And I, could, I, I, saw, I watched this happen. And um, in in, in absolute fear, thinking it's not even coming from him, it's coming from me. This is terrible. I've got to get over my fear in order to help him, which which I worked on doing. So so as parents, we have these fears or negative habits, which we we might pass on to to our to our kids. Uh, What kind of advice would you have about? We will pass them on. Absolutely not right. We will pass them on. Kids pick up uh, on what we're doing all the time and and even if we try to fake it they pick up on the fact that we're faking it yeah so they know and they have to know it's vital for their survival absolutely that that's what gets them from infancy to childhood to adulthood is Mm -hmm. i gotta look at these guys and see what they're doing and what they're thinking and what they're feeling and how they're acting you know, so yeah, they they absolutely know what's going on with us, mm-hmm. and I think it's uh, difficult, if not impossible, to hide those fears. But we all try to do it. You know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so what can I say about fears? We all have them, mm-hmm. and I think the greatest damage you can do to a kid is to impose your own fears on them. Mm-hmm. You know, in uh, in some unmoderated, direct fashion, you know, mm-hmm. that, that, that the child then, you know, becomes afraid of, of doing normal things just mm-hmm. because of your own personal hang-ups. Yeah, so that would be like, I don't like something, so it's bad for you because I don't like it kind of thing. Would yeah, sometimes it, like- it comes across like that, of course, sure. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, so, you know, I, I remember once my, my second wife uh, said something very important in terms of parenting. She said um, that if you, as a, an adult, if you haven't cleared up your own issues, in the sense of going to therapy or working on these things, that are problems, we all have them, that if you haven't, then as soon as you have a kid, they will come to the surface. They will come right to the surface. They'll be right there. All the things, all the demons that you have buried inside you, all the fears you have, as you said, all that stuff will come right up. So it's um, it would behoove us all to clear some of that stuff up before we have kids. But we don't have time. We don't have money. We don't have the energy. Sometimes we don't have the inclination because we think it's silly. So we have our kids, and we pass along our fears and our problems to them directly. Yeah. And, and that is, again, one of the differences between being a parent at 64 mm-hmm. and being a parent at 35 or 33 or 30. Not that I don't have problems or fears. I still do, but they're much smaller. And they, they play much less a role in my life than they did when I was younger and a lot more confused and a lot more worried about other things. So, you know, yeah. So the, so the so level, level of importance, of importance has, changed. has changed. Oh, absolutely. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Whereas, it, you know, when I was 32, the important thing was was getting to work on time. Now the important thing is getting my daughter to her school on time. But doing it in, in a relaxed way, that's the other thing too, is, you know, uh, back then, uh, you know, things were sometimes pretty hyper, you know, and we 
don't have much time. We have to do this. We have to do that. There was a lot of pressure to get things done according to a certain schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, now uh, that I'm retired, I can say, hey, if we don't make this bus, we'll catch the next one, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's why Ooh. when walking to school, we can stop and look at a, a plant. And yeah. so what if she's five minutes or 10 minutes later? <laughs> it's more important that she learns that the black locust holds onto its tree, uh, holds onto its leaves longer than the other trees, than getting to, to her little room on time, you know. Oh, oh, oh. This, this whole thing is, is schooling. schooling. Okay. Yeah, well. Yeah, so many so things, things I have to, have to work on. Okay. okay. Uh, as as I, oh, we're getting, oh, we're getting a little bit of feedback here sure. uh, from the sound. Does the sound okay on your side? Yeah. Yeah, we have a little bit of a, an echo. Yeah, we're getting an echo back. And, um, no, we're no, getting we're an, echo an echo back, back, back of our own voice, but uh, hopefully it'll hopefully it'll fade away and disappear. It's gone now, I think. It's gone. Gone. I it's think gone. it's gone. Okay, we'll try to go through it. It's just that I okay. <laughs> I've got my glasses back, 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 back at me as I speak, so yeah, that okay. Makes sense. <laughs> That'll be why. Um, as an older parent. Um, and my parents are, are I think, getting old now, and I'm worrying about my obligations to help them. Yeah, so from your perspective, how obligated should children be to, to be there for the parents when, as the parents get older? Well, uh, if you had asked me this question 30 years ago when I was living in the United States, I'd say, Okay. Not much. Who cares? <laughs> That's what old old folks' homes are for. You know that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, no. My my perspective has changed obviously since I moved to Poland, where mm -hmm. uh, the 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 approach to parenting mm -hmm. and family life in general is different. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I I think that uh, the kids uh, do owe their parents. Uh, um, Payback time, <laughs> yeah, for all those dirty diapers. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, so um, so they they should be at least checking in <laughs> with the parents about. Oh yeah, so they should be checking in, helping, calling, saying I love you. Yeah, of course, your your family. Okay, super. Thank you. Um, Never ends. It doesn't end, you know. It, oh, now you're eighteen. Adios. Yeah, I, I, I really get that perspective. Um, although I, I, I know people who have different perspectives, but I think your perspective makes more sense. Well, it's nicer at Christmas. There's more people around the table, you know. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If you can't connect then, what can you connect? There we go. So, best and worst pieces of parenting advice. What do you think about people out there, especially with us? If you could uh, pick out a few experiences that you've had, something that's made a difference to you, well, what would it? What would it be? What would you say to us? Well, I think one thing was uh, something that I learned. Uh, this was a, a while ago when I was still in the United States, and uh, there was a psychologist uh, who had a regular article in the local newspaper. And I liked what he had to say, um, not about 100% of the stuff, but, but a lot of what he had to say uh, made a lot of sense to me. And we, my wife and I then applied it to raising our kids. And his position was this, that children should be given limits. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, Okay. You have four limits. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. There borders. There should be a clear border, a clear boundary yeah. for the kid. Absolutely. Within this border, the child has freedom to act as he wants, as he wishes. Mm -hmm. But You're there sorry. are. Sorry, one second. Oh, sorry. I have one ahead. Yeah, okay. No, she's, she's okay. She's, she's, we got, we, we, I don't, what is she doing over there? I'm not quite sure what it is that she's doing over there. Struggling. Str struggling. Struggling with something. She got her blanket stuck. The blanket is stuck. Okay. okay. Can you can you run over there and sort the blanket out and come yes. back? Okay. Okay. Super cool. 
I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. Parent is a real time parent. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, so we're talking about limits. Limits. In, in the sense that, <clears throat> for example, uh, one of the limits is you don't touch the kitchen stove. When a child is two. Got it. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't want to see a parent who didn't have any limits. In other words, they allow their kids to do whatever they want to do. Well, I'm not going to allow my child to touch the stove. If there's a pot cooking on it, because they could reach up, because they're curious, they could scald themselves, injure themselves. So that's a that's a border. That's a limit. Now. Within, the, and there are other such limits, right? And so when a child is small, the limits are narrower. But as the child grows, you expand those limits. So the area where the child has free decision power, do whatever they want, becomes broader and broader and broader. And I think that's one of the important roles of the parents. I, I, um, I have a couple of friends that I know here mm -hmm. at Mia's Preschool mm -hmm. who have a different approach. Okay. And I see the results. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a kid who does not listen mm -hmm. to her parents. It's a child who, um, well, the old, the old term was uh, it's spoiled, mm -hmm. you know. And mm -hmm. I'm enough of an old fashioned guy that uh, I think that, um, uh, the role of the parent is to protect the child, make sure he's safe, teach the child, mm -hmm. and allow the child to develop at his own pace, mm -hmm. but not unchecked and allow the kid to do whatever he wants. That's mm -hmm. Yeah, not the way to go. So that so that's one of the things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really nice. It's a nice explanation. Um, I'm personally. Oh, thinking about how I can judge my own success as a parent. Um, is there a way that parents can do that at all? I mean, is there a way to objectively look at what we're doing and say, yes, we're doing the right thing, that's working? Difficult question. <laughs> I, I don't know if we can okay. while we're in the process. I think it's only afterwards. Mm -hmm. but, but while we're in the process, I think, yes, if your child is happy, if your child is well adjusted in the sense of gets along with others, gets along with other kids, gets along with other adults, um, if he's going to preschool or school, if the teachers give you um, good feedback about uh, your child, um, then you can, if, if neighbors, for example, uh, also give you good feedback about your child, how they've seen him behave, then, then you get a sense from the larger world that what you're doing is, is okay. Mm -hmm. but, but the child is the most important. If they are happy and uh, developing well, then, uh, then you're doing a good job. Uh -huh. Okay, super cool. Is there anything finally that you'd like to um, like to share with us? Is there any other little bits of advice you can give to us? Is there anything that uh, that you think we need to, we, we need to know as parents? <laughs> and any any little bit is really appreciated. Um, Relax. That's good. I like, I like that. that one. Relax. <laughs> Relax. That's, that's, that's uh, let it go. The things that we think that's, are huge. <laughs> Oh yeah. No, you know the, the things that we think are so important sometimes. Mm -hmm. That are really and in three decades, you look back and you go, "My God, I thought that was important." I uh, They're, not. To do that They're not. Relax. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's okay, super cool. We would like to thank you very much. much for the time today that you've given us. We really, really, really appreciate it. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Stay on the line, stay on the phone for, for one minute and we'll do a little bit of feedback. But, okay. um, if people want to get in touch with you for any more information, is there a Facebook page or somehow they can contact you? No, my Facebook page, of course, the Messenger, right? 
Facebook page. Okay, that's that's super cool. Um, if people online are interested in getting more information about what we do, it's the Academy of Language Therapy and Life Coaching. Uh, it's on Facebook and on YouTube as well. The home website is www dot nsa-slovakia.com And who is this? This is... This is Zora. Zora! Hello, Zora. How are you? She's, she's a bit shy. She's, she's a bit shy today. Jasmine is sliding down my sit-up um, yeah, so people can get in touch with us online. Your blog is 21centurymum spelled M U M dot com. Okay, so uh, check that out as well. And so thank you very, very, very much again for the time. It's really, really, really appreciated. And uh, for the people online, everybody wave bye bye. Thank you. See ya. Thank you too. Okay.